This podcast is sponsored by Galecki and Associates. Better recruiters. Better results. In McKinsey's Future of Work study, they cite finance and insurance best suited for remote work, estimating that as much as 76% of time can be spent working from home without any loss to productivity. That's only one day in the office a week. So companies should be thinking about how to create a long-term experience that incorporates work from home flexibility, access to tools employees need at home, and this is important, build camaraderie in a digital or hybrid environment so that people feel they can advance in the company and stay long-term. All this seems to align with what we are hearing from candidates. They want the flexibility and benefits as well as the ability to progress in their careers without the commute. And now that talent has had a taste of freedom, their expectations for what they deserve and demand has changed. We're at an inflection point. The time is now to transform your culture into one that can support remote workers or you will lose the war on talent. And hello, everyone. This is episode one of the Yellow Book Road podcast. I'm going to try to do something a little bit different here where um, it'll be part interview format, part webinar. But the basic idea is how can we get best practices in other industries, technology, finance, I don't care if it's construction. Is there something that's being done correctly that we in this space should be taking note of and then how do we implement it? And so it is uh, a pleasure to be talking to these two individuals because in uh, different ways, they've been very influential in how I've thought about insurance uh, Steve Lekas, who's the CEO, and Joe Emerson, who's the CTO of Branch Insurance, are joining me for episode one. And uh, guys, I'm thrilled. I'm honored. Welcome. Well, Nick, I think uh, <clears throat> we're excited to be your first guests. Uh, you know, love, uh, uh, love the name, the Yellow Book Road. Uh, I think when you grow up reading yellow books uh, that uh, I couldn't help smile when I heard you say it. So we're really uh, excited to be here. And, and the Yellow Book Road is a wink and a nod uh, for anyone that's in PNC that's worked in back office operations where you had to file uh, stuff to the NAIC or to a regulator. The color of the property casualty book is yellow. Uh, we will do life and others, and those have other colors. I think life is blue, but they have salmon and brown. It's uh, in this digital world. It's kind of funny that there's actually a yellow book. So, um, and it was fun when I, when, when I invited Steve on, he said, right, we can talk about yellow books. We file those all the time. So uh, we, we may get into that as, as well. So um, I want, I've introduced you, um, but I want to kind of get into the meat of this. Um, Steve, Joe, can you guys talk about branch insurance and what your, what, what is the mission of branch? Yeah, thanks, Nick. I'll uh, start off, Joe, if that's cool. Um, you know, we talk about Branch internally, the very clear mission, and that that is that Branch is on a mission to make insurance less expensive so more people can be insured. And there's a lot packed into that, right? You know, it starts with the idea that insurance can be less expensive. Right. I mean, one of the interesting things I think about the InsurTech movement is that everyone says they're making less expensive insurance. But from a, a more scientific perspective, where do you take the money from? Right. It wasn't going nowhere and it usually wasn't going to profit if you're familiar with our industry. So how would you do it? And the uh, the other half of the statement is about about the good insurance was always supposed to do. Uh, and when we talk about so more people can be insured, you know, it may sound like so we can grow our company, but more fundamentally, insurance grew up in this country as people banding together and contributing small bits of resources so the unfortunate few didn't fall off of their life's trajectory. We're trying to reintroduce that old concept, and we think we can reintroduce some really interesting aspects of it through technology and de-individualize it, right? The way that it actually works, right? Because insurance is, is a communal product. There is no insurance product of one. Uh, that would be an in-bank account and a bank account doesn't always indemnify, 
And so that's, uh, that's how we think uh, at a very broad level of what Branch's mission is. Yeah, and I think if I'm just going to add on to that a little bit. We saw an enormous, we saw enormous holes in what was available. I mean, insurance as an industry, even through the first round of insurtex, really hasn't made a, meaningful changes uh, in terms of cost structure, as Steve is talking about, but also experience. I mean, you know, the the ideal experience and 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 for the core of the market, the people who own homes and own cars. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, what? So, uh, given what Steve just said, right? Um, you've had some successful um, entrepreneurial activities before this, and you're so you have a technological background. Um, you probably have like an inkling or more of like how insurance is supposed to work. So, when when you hear Steve's message, um, can can you tell me like uh, the the devil play the devil's advocate or have the little angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. How are you processing that as a technologist and entrepreneur thinking about, we want to try to make insurance more affordable. What was, what was the, uh, the elements of the story that was like, this is attractive beyond just like it's, <laughs> it's technologically complex. How are you processing through all of that? It's this. It's a great question. You know, I, I, although I think my answer may surprise you. Um, at the time Steve approached me, I was working as a CIO for a company that had that I had discovered had terrible unit economics, and they the company was essentially lying to itself um, by having let's call it non GAAP um, <laughs> accounting uh, measures. Uh, and so I had really reached a point where. Um, I was, I wanted to be part of a business that was a good business. Uh, and so my focus really at that point was real understanding the economics of the business. And so when Steve came to me, the questions that I had for him were really about how, you know, how is it possible to take the money out, right? How are, how do you actually decrease the cost of making insurance? Um, but another thing is that I had known Steve at that time for maybe almost 10 years and he and I had both done things with an insurance state. I had done deals with him on the other side of the table multiple times. And he also laid out this vision of, you know, we can instantly bind people. We can take name and address uh, and make a bindable home and auto price for you that you can just buy, right? You, no data entry, just name and address. Uh, and, and I had been enough in the industry and he had been enough in the industry where I knew that, I mean, I knew that this was yep. tr probably true. And so in talking through that, I was also incredibly excited about that piece because it's, I mean, it's just different. Nobody does it. Uh, and so that also was exciting to me as a, as a challenge uh, and we've done it. Yeah. And, and so Steve, it harkens back to um, the conversation that you and I had years ago is probably going five years before InsureTech was even a thing. And both you and I were at our previous roles and we were sort of, um, you know, discussing, kind of working through, like, it, I don't, it probably wasn't even a kernel of an idea for us, but I was also concerned, like, with, you know, with what both of you guys are saying was, um, how can we make it more affordable? I was coming at it from the natural catastrophe side. So I had just gone through Hurricane Sandy and saw the disaster, you know, people that were homeless that had insurance. And then I moved to California and I saw uh, a market where 90% of the property owners don't have any earthquake coverage. And it's like, what are we doing? How is this even possible? And the more I dug into it, the more disappointed I got, because it was like, this is more lethargy than anything. As Joe said, we, the tech's there, right? So how do we do it? It brought me, one of the things that I think we discussed on our call that I was coming to the realization was that catastrophe insurance was going to be really difficult to sell as a mono line. Like if you, if you made it voluntary um, because it's so infrequent, people would opt out. They would look for any reason why, you know, like, Oh, we haven't had a hurricane in five years. I could probably cut that out and save some money um, or an earthquake or whatever. And so going through your site, it's just really difficult to not view the bundling piece of it and get excited about that because by bundling, you're doing a whole bunch of positive elements. Like there's a lot of um, amplification stacking of positive things that can happen. Can, can you guys both talk, talk to me about 
why the bundling? I, I'm assuming I'm assuming the audience knows why bundling is important. But from your perspective, can you talk about what that does to fulfill your mission? Joe's on mute, so I think I'll go first. Uh, but um, you know, Nick, you're you're right. I mean, there are so many virtues to bundling, especially in our market, right? I, I grew up in in this space, uh, and so the underwriter's perspective is that auto insurance is two thirds liability premiums and very consistent in volatility. Mm -hmm. And homeowners insurance is 97% property premiums and can be quite volatile and, and priced on much longer a term. And so you get a natural diversification benefit yep. right back to the reinsurance problem or the surplus problem of underwriting two lines at once. The consumer's perspective is that um, I should save and have convenience by centralizing spend. And that doesn't, it's not unique to insurance, but in insurance, it's very obvious, right? Because we have a stack of capital, losses, loss adjustment, profit, general expense and acquisition. And that's how you make a premium, right? And so when you put what was a $1,000 homeowner policy and a $1,500 auto policy together, there are natural um, economies of scale in how we underwrite, and that's passed back as savings to the consumer. This is such an unknown thing uh, that you can't do that same thing if you don't underwrite both products, right? You won't get those economies of scale, and so you're always trying to create a perception of bundling benefit that you didn't actually have. But the third reason is nobody does it. It's just us. I mean, imagine this. For, for 60 years, we've been advertising bundle and save insurance to consumers, and they can finish that sentence. Um, but um, we're the only digital offerer of home and auto insurance. And in that constrained market, there was additional opportunity. But back to the benefits of bundling, it's the biggest part of the market, like by a lot. It's also the highest lifetime value part of the market. And lifetime becomes so critical. I, I, you know, you, you guys write about this uh, in your uh, uh, in Coverager and, and on other podcasts I've heard you talk about. The unit economics becomes so much more challenging if your customers don't stick around because the way we price a direct product is we predict persistency and we amortize that upfront uh, acquisition expenditure over a expected lifetime. And if you don't get it, that tends to be the cardinal sin of direct startup insurance businesses, which yeah. you know, I've had a chance to do before. So I I'm not even covering the beginning of why <laughs> bundling is so important, but the most important aspect is this is how consumers shop and buy. And if you did the straight math and you'll know we'll be just short of a $400 billion home and auto market this year, that something, you know, something uh, north of 265 billion of it's going to be people who own homes, who own cars. And so, why would you not do this? I'll tell you, the, you didn't ask me this. I'll ask my own question. Do you do that on a podcast? But Please run the show. Go. <laughs> Nick, Nick, the only reason you wouldn't start by bundling because it's what consumers need is that you simply didn't know that that's what consumers needed. Yeah. And we or, or you thought it was too complex. Like, yeah, it is, it's like, highly complex. Oh, we have to do like this is this is two underwriting elements. Right. And I think from an, from an old school perspective, right. So it'll be really interesting to, to hear how you're just doing it with like a name and an address, but from an old school perspective, you know, an auto app has a bunch of questions. I don't know how many, but a lot homeowners app has even more. Oh, we're going to combine those two. No one will stick around long enough to buy it. Yeah. Complex. Yeah. Which I was waiting for Joe to jump back in on his instant point. So you know, Nick, I, you knew that uh, I created the first online home insurance business in the nation yep. for another company years ago, and it was a great business. Uh, ran its target loss ratio very effectively under it and grew to $100 million in five years just in the inland markets. Uh, didn't have a price differential to the rest of the marketplace, and uh, it was 83 questions to buy digitally. But you could buy digitally, right? That was the innovation. It's still 83 questions, can yeah. you imagine? And so like add, you know, and that's like half of the industry in homeowners. And so if you put that together with auto, yeah, if you created a thing no one did because it was equally challenging, right? You need an agent today uh, in order to purchase uh, the bundle and save. But 
there isn't a business that has a direct like model, right? That is, uh, you know, a lower cost of creation for not having as high an acquisition load baked in. And we were the first to do that. We're, I mean, we're so excited about it. Plus it's extensible, right? You know, you have the ability to add more products. If you have a discipline in bundling and the old school product penetration economics are, you know, two, two insights I'll, I'll say. One is when you add more products to the same account, the lifetime increases. But if you entangle those products, if those products are entangled, so if I sold you a, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and an auto insurance policy, my guess is that it doesn't meaningfully increase lifetime. But when we sell you a home insurance product that decreases the price for your auto, that then if you drop the home, it increases the price for the auto and vice versa. This entangling effect is a real impact uh, to persistency yeah. and so important to the economics so that you can give less expensive insurance to consumers. There's, there's another thing I think that is important to think about this, which is that if you start monoline and then you want to add the bundle, you run these, I mean, for all time, you run these as separate businesses with separate P&Ls. That's what everyone else who, who underwrites both does. And what that does is that eliminates a lot of the economy of scale benefit you have, right? So there is like an organizational aspect to the way we have started, which is that there isn't home and auto as separate things. You can imagine you, if you have a home business that's growing rapidly and you add auto and you're going to put that under different people, you're going to put out different targets on it. We haven't done that. Our bread and butter is centralized. And so that means you don't get these, like we don't care if you're coming in for the auto and we sell you the home or you're coming in for the home and we sell you the auto, it's the same pot. It's the same uh, you know, amount. And that is that allows us to go after one policy and sell two and not have weird transfer pricing between departments, which doesn't work and which, you know, gets these fee yeah. and ultimately drives your price up. I, I love that you brought that up. Um, I wasn't planning on going or, you know, talking about that specifically because I didn't know how, how deep, like this is, this is really insurance nerdy stuff. So this is like right, right in our wheelhouse. I love talking about that because, um, so this is best practices, like from a finance person, like people who work at like um, hedge funds or trading firms, you know, investment banks, they know this, like this is, you, you know, they are constantly spending time working on the correlations of stuff. And their whole goal is to continuously add more positive expected value with low correlation. The more you can put in, the more you're dropping the risk of the portfolio while maintaining the stackable elements of the expected value. And Joe, I came across that. I'm coming across that with flood. Now, as I approach carriers, it's, um, a, you know, Hey, can, you know, you know, they, can we add your product to your flood product to our homeowners product? Right. And the wall that ends up like that process is easy adding it piece of cake, but then it's, well, okay. Is it a separate product, separate p &L, oh shoot the reinsurance we're gonna have like like everything becomes this chinese wall to um quarantine the rest of the book from it and as i start to think through how how are we going to dovetail this in i real i recognize and it was just recently recognized this is a monumental challenge like the the traditional insurers have very little ability to be able to do this, we're going to have to catch them at the right reinsurance renewal. Like we, we, and we're going to have a checklist of stuff we're going to have to nail down. It could take years for us to overcome that in order to imbe truly embed our product in. Joe, it sounds like what from what you guys did, it's kind of like how a tech person would think about how you need to embed the different pieces of the stack, thinking how is this going to play out in two years? We want to be ready for that. So we want to make sure we're not disentangling old tech to embed new tech and the insurance piece sounds like almost the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah, Nick, yeah. I'll add to, you know, as you cover that story about flood, <clears throat> I'm sure you probably know this, but this is how home insurance started, right? It was five distinct products. Yeah. You had to buy a separate GL inland Marine, uh, what was fire insurance and all other peril product and stitch them together uh, with the help of an agent. 
and, and typically, point. typically they were different insurance companies because you know our industry grew up as fire insurance, right? The the wind, the tornadic policy was its own invention, and so for all the same reasons Joe said and that you said, like imagine like back at the dawn of these things trying to figure out reinsurance and capacity and application and distribution. And so there was this genius moment that's supposedly 1950. It was an insurance company of North America, which I think is now a Chubb owned property. And they put it all together. And it was less than 10 years before it was the dominant product in property insurance because it gave consumers ease. But you also had a 40% expense structure for each of those products that essentially became just one. And so the consumer got price and ease, like simplification that became so powerful. And like, you know, uh, I mean, it's been the dominant product in this space for 60 years, seven I'm, years. I'm going to share, I'm going to share the PDF article. Um, I, and, and Steve, I don't know if you've seen this one, but you're clearly hinting at um, some of, some of the points from this particular article. It was published in the fifties and it's an old casualty actuarial society publication. I forget the author's name, but I have the PDF of it. And they talked about the, um, the launch of the bundled product. And this actuary kind of talked about all of the uh, objections. Nobody asked for this. Everything's working just fine, right? Like it, almost probably all of the same objections you may have heard, but a lot of the objections I heard, you know, when on my end, when we talked about in adding more into the bundle. It's like, well, nobody asked for this. And it, it just a big head scratcher to me because a lot of the same people who asked that, like they, they'll go through like the agency system. It's like, are you sure they're, they, they're not asking because they don't have a problem or are they not asking because they really want it, but don't know about it? Or they've asked before and you guys, you know, gave them the stiff arm on that. And I think that's a big piece of the bundling and probably is, was that an issue that you guys had to overcome when you were going through this is that nobody asked for this. You know, I think Nick, that one's a little lighter for us because our market is known. What we have heard a lot of is why do you guys keep talking about bundling from the, uh, you know, the uh, uninitiated, right? Uh, investment bankers and other startups, um, that uh, have tried to bundle after the fact. And it's very difficult to do. You know, I, I've had a chance to try this myself and you're trying it too. You know, and on flood as a point of note, I love flood insurance, right? I, I left California, uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, I love flood and earthquake insurance, but the big drawback on flood has been for decades that it can only be 250,000 and it doesn't follow the homeowner's form. And so it was already a complex product. like. The bundling need is, is so great, right? And in what we do, like we don't offer quotes. We, we never quote a person. We've never given a quote. Every price that you see at Branch is purchasable when you see it in seconds, digitally or otherwise. And in that model, we gather a tremendous amount of information to fully underwrite because there's a known level, a quantifiable level of, of underwriting science in the known segmentation. And if you give that away, then there is a story that can also be um, you know, foretold for how your business will run. And so we had to solve some really unique problems to put this together, but there's a lot of synergy in the information you need too, as far as the virtues of bundling. And so in putting this all together, we have a lot of data as well that would let us uh, help you underwrite flood, right? If it were yeah. embedded in our bundle, right? Because back to the beginning of this, like this has to be about generating new value for consumers, right? And if you want to do it as a startup insurance company, these, there's only one definition of a special insurance company. And that is one that's differentiated in its customer's eyes that, that deserve it rapid growth and a positive underwriting outcome. And so like all this has to come together, but the bundle uh, and flood, I think uh, two pieces that, that uh, you know, that will be a part of the, the future story. I love it. And how flood comes to market. I love it. I can't help uh, Joe, the tech piece. So um, walk us through how you're thinking about 
uh, you had experience collecting data. So you must have known like, okay, I, I know where I could probably get this. Steve's got that experience as well. But now you're talking um, multiple underwriting systems and there's, you know, having gone through that, that's not necessarily easy. Cloud-based, um, direct to consumer. There's, um, so there's customer experience. There's a lot going on there. And um, most people would never see how much sausage is being made, but there's a lot being made. Can you walk us through how you thought through the tech piece and what you, some of the things you sort of had to nail down first before you could move on to other things? What were the priorities? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably helpful to talk a little about my philosophy, um, which is that um, I believe that code is a liability. So like any, mm -hmm. like what your asset is the experience you deliver. Um, it's not the lines of code. And anybody who like is, you know, give, compensating developers based on the number of lines of code or judging them based on the number of lines of code they're creating, that's a terrible idea because that all of that you have to maintain. And, and you know, we're bad as an industry. Also, software development as an industry is very young. We continually realize that things we thought were best practices are terrible. Um, and, uh, you know, there are all sorts of things that, you know, good software developers would not go, do anything without today that were like, didn't exist or, you know, no one did 10 years ago. And by the way, those people are, who were doing it 10 years ago are still doing it today, right? And so like, there's a tremendous, there's a huge gap, uh, say in other words, between the average software development organization and let's say top 10%. Like it, like the, the ability to develop and deliver is just massive between those two. And I think a big part of being able to be very effective at software development is one, not developing software when you don't have to. And so, uh, you know, I have a very strong buy versus build view on things. And let's say, even if you looked at an, at, like we use Zendesk for customer support, uh, customer service, and for handling underwriting tasks. Um, and so you could look at it and you could say, well, this, okay, like maybe we could get started with this. Maybe this does, you know, if I look into the future, I can see a world where this won't work. And so there are a lot of organizations that would hit that moment and go, great, we got to build it ourselves. Like yep. that's, that's insane. Like what you should do is you should use Zendesk. You should use it as long as you can because it will be cheaper and you'll be able to start immediately and you can put all the support on them. So your service team can be completely independent of your software development or, or, or tech teams. They can do everything themselves with that. And then you wait until they can't do something. And guess what? First of all, you can use it a lot longer than you thought you could at the beginning because you build a relationship with the vendor, you use their solutions architects and you, you go set things up. You do maybe a little custom programming in it, but you know, it's very simple. And then when you reach the moment where it's not good enough, you have the specifications, you know what you need it for and you know what it doesn't do. And then you can build something that actually works for it as opposed to whatever you're gonna build in the beginning, which is gonna be a total miss and you're gonna to have to keep rebuilding it. You're gonna be delayed. You're gonna spend all this money on it. And you're gonna have something that, you know, probably has a lot of technical debt because where, when it gets to functional, it's very different from the original vision. Because again, people think they're gonna be good at designing software. People are terrible at designing software. So, I mean- That, that sounds that sounds like uh, a lot like lean startup, like lean methodology. Like, I mean, I think, you know, the only thing is you can end up spending a lot of money here, right? I mean, this is one yeah. of the challenges is you look at it and you say, well, gosh, we've got all these software developers and they can build stuff and the hosting cost is low and I've got to pay Zendesk, you know, $20,000 a year, right? I mean, you can look at that and say, yeah. well, that's silly. I should build it myself. And I mean, the problem is, again, you have to, you have to have the humility to say, like, I, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be good at specifying this. Um, so it, it, with that philosophy, you asked the first question. The first question was, do we buy or build a policy admin system? Um, and so I've spent a lot of time and I've talked to a lot of vendors and, and I, I still ask this question, by the way. So we built our own policy admin system, knowing that we're this big, you know, buy versus build. We built it. Uh, we built the purchase experience. We built endorsements. Uh, we built like all the reporting uh, functionality to services that help us do reporting. Um, but, you know, we, we had a great advisor um, uh, initially who, who said you should build it yourself. Um, and um, and uh, Nandini Isor, who is at, uh, who's, who's now CTO of a wonderful startup um, uh, called Speakfully, um, 
But, um, you know, what we found was we could use this service called Clarion Door. It's a great service. Everyone should be using Clarion Door. So Clarion Door will handle your rating and your forms for you. So those are things. So we didn't build a rater. And we didn't build form generation and we don't deal with the versioning of rates and the, and the versioning of forms. Clarion Door handles all of that for us. Uh, so we pay them, but then we get to build the entire experience. And so one of the, one of the great questions, of, I think, in building software effectively is to ask, what is the right abstraction layer between what you build and what you need? And Clarion Door has the exact, I think, the exact set, right setup, which is, they handle these things that are pure back office, they're pure API driven, they're all on the cloud that our customers you know, never see and that we don't need to build. There's no need for us to build our own rater if there's a way to set up a rater with the right rates. And, and here's the wonderful thing, our product team, our insurance product team just works directly with them. So there's, we don't block, there's no developers at branch blocking putting new rates in. So we, 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 you know, we make a change, it just gets put in. And it's fantastic. Yeah, but Steve, it sounds like a lot of that is um, partially, a lot of that philosophy as well is embedded in all of the insurance, not just like how the, the rater or the tech or the customer experience, but the actual insurance element of it sort of, it sounds like it runs through a very similar um, level, uh, the, the same gauntlet of is this adding value or not and how you're making decisions. You guys seem, it seems very complimentary. The insurance side and the tech side seems to have dovetailed. Yeah, Nick, I mean, you know, Joe's got a great phrase uh, about not spending energy on undifferentiated heavy lifting. Yep. I love that. And so I think, I think that plays out uh, across the entire business. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got a great claims team. We've got a phenomenal distribution team. You know, we're not just D to C work we're somewhat more omnichannel. Um, and so like making any of these decisions, you're actually deploying more energy in new spaces. One, one of the other things Joe didn't mention about our dev team is we're 90% front end development. It's about the complexity of bringing all of the friction in house so that the consumer sees this simple and really wonderful experience. And so we play that, uh, that plays in every part of how we think about, you know, short term and long term. And I didn't mention it earlier, Nick, but our brand is about community, right? At pulling on that thread I mentioned. Yeah. And we think about what does it mean to get our, our members backs? Because that's how we talk about it inside and out. Um, and we make all the decisions in the company around value creation and staying true to that do good uh, and make it less expensive uh, mantra. That becomes very obvious going through your website. So appreciate that. Our, our, uh, our uh, marketing team will really appreciate that. Yeah. So um, a couple of things that stood out um, is the community pledge as well. So um, why don't you walk us through that? Because I, I think the community pledge is actually serving multiple purposes here and ties back very nicely to that. We got your back. Yeah, thanks. Nick. And, you know, I'll just start to lamenting a bit that there hasn't been enough product innovation in startup. There have been a lot of great experiences, especially in the, the home and car market. Yep, I've seen uh, it. A lot, a lot of energy on new experiences, a lot of energy moving the business direct to consumer. Uh, but the only reason to be a full stack insurance entity is so that you can be inches better in every regard for your customers. This is what it means to be good. Uh, and, uh, and so Community Pledge is, is an example of some really interesting product innovations, um, but ours play out across the structural landscape, the regulatory landscape, insurance product, definitely on the user experience uh, and in brand. Um, but what Community Pledge is, is an opportunity for our members, our clients to self-identify as non-fraud, right? And, and we acknowledge with them that fraud costs us all a bunch of money. And, and if you went back to the brand that says this isn't a product of you and me and like, I'm gonna save you when things go bad, right? We, we take that ego out of it. And we tell our, our clients that it's everyone else who's here, right? It's their pooled resources yeah. that'll make the problem be less of a problem. Uh, and, 
And Community Pledge leverages that same ideology to say, if Nick says, I'm not going to defraud the branch membership, then through our tech, we'll allow Nick to uh, expose that pledge to other members in our joint network. So if you thought about a tripod of trust, or I should say a triangle of trust, branch knows Nick and Nick knows another member that branch knows. And if Joe vouches for Nick, yeah, Nick is not one of those, right? And so all this acknowledgement, uh, you know, is a reference to the fact that it's few people committing bad actor acts that cost us all tremendous money. And so what we're doing through the technology is every time someone vouches for Nick, uh, who's taken this community pledge, we put Nick in a different category from price perspective. And it gives us this ability to change the deserved rate level for the pledged community and yep. the, the unpledged. And in doing that, we use technology to sort people, a new risk segmentation simply, right? But what's really neat about this is it's, it leverages behavioral psychology, yep. right? Because now it's not just you and me and you were you and I was some nameless, faceless organization probably has deep pockets, right? Like we know how that alignment works out. And in Branch's brand, what we're reintroducing is that we're, we're telling you how efficient it is. We're telling you that it's, it's built to do good for society. And that in this particular case, Nick, if you lie about the pledge, you know, Joe's identity is also at risk, right? Your interaction with Joe. And so we take those opportunities to, if, if, like, we're a reciprocal exchange. And, and, you know, the first reciprocal back in 1881, this group of dry goods merchants in New York, they all knew each other. And if you go back 100 years before that, it was farmers, you know, in, in, in uh, county mutuals, they all knew each other. And you knew, Nick, if your barn burned down, that you were going to draw on my resource. You know, these were accessible policies at the time. And we'd kick in for each other in a moment and help rebuild. And like that was, uh, that created a lot of mutual accountability and trust because we had to. And so we've lost so much of that in the, in the era of big brands where, you know, I want you to know that it's me as this entity, this brand who's saving you. And Branches, you know, just thinks about that all in a kind of classic manner and community pledges both a real innovation that will better sort fraud dollars in an insurance construct, but allows us to interact on brand, which is reintroducing the idea of community and insurance that can align and better incent the correct outcomes, cheaper insurance. Where'd, the, where'd this specific idea come from? It's, it has, um, just listening to it, the, the whole, hey, if you, if you commit fraud, people who have vouched for you are going to be weighted less or have, there's gonna be a negative effect to them. There's a, there's a network aspect to that, which I would assume over time makes it anti-fragile, right? It's just gonna get stronger and stronger knowing that um, it'd be difficult to game, right? Um, could you just talk about like, how'd you, how'd you come up with that? How'd you put that together? Was that, was that transported from, you know, finance or another industry? You know, um, and real quick, one point to Nick, cause the first question I usually get is, well, what's going to stop the fraudsters from taking the pledge. And, you know, I started my career in claims and I tell people like, you, you know, that the first many months of an SIU investigation is just trying to ID the network, right? Can be many years. Like I'd love for a small discount for people to start to give us, you know, all of that intel, like no one's going to, so, it, you know, there's all kinds of, could it go wrong, but the incentives are all stacked up just right. Yeah. Um, but uh, the idea was really uh, a part of the original Genesis. Like, you know, this was part of what Joe and I started with. And this one particularly uh, was one I'd been working through the, the name branch um, is uh, a, uh, an offshoot of one of the early uh, insurance history stories that I'd learned, which I think is the first underwriting segmentation and pricing segmentation known in the US market, which all around uh, surrounded the Green Tree Mutual. And so that was the, the original nod. 
Um, but I loved branch because we were trying to figure out ways to align incentives for the long term, right? All of our early differentiation is in tech and in, um, in distribution models uh, that really um, give us the ability to entirely flip how this market works. But on a long-term basis, we can also make insurance less expensive if people understood better how it benefited them to act in their own self-interest. Uh, and as opaque as it is, like, God, I mean, many of the people that operate in this market don't really understand how it works. To uh, externalize it all to a consumer, it's hard. And so yeah. I was searching for mechanisms like this one um, where we could create better alignment than we'd had with a real belief that insurance was good hadn't always been good to people, but its original intent was good. And so in something like this, we use technology and real product, you know, underwriting acumen uh, to bring less expensive in insurance to the consumers that deserve it. It's all, you know, yeah. almost couldn't help coming across this idea as you scope through those ideas. No, because, you know, some of your competitors have taken different angles to do it. Um, fraud's a problem. Right. And so this, this one seems like quite unique, interesting. I hadn't heard of something like that. Um, the pledge at first just seems sort of uh, wishy-washy, but the way you just described it is just very powerful, right? Like it's, you know, you can have, Hey, if I, if I make this false claim, I'm taking money away from a charity or I'm, I'm actually harming my friend. Right. Um, different dynamic, n not maybe one's better than the other, who knows, but um, different angle. But I think this one particular one, I think has ramifications, like the, the data that gets being collected will allow you to do a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it could be used like, like if you, if you have customers, like if you end up going into commercial and doing bops or something else, like you'll, those people that do end up bundling the BOP or getting the BOP, you'll already have this information about mm -hmm. them that would be extremely difficult to get in the other mechanisms that are kind of out there, which um, it just gets to like, we're in a data business, right? Like data is our oil here. It just lubricates so many different things that you, that you, you, had, you can now leverage this information to do other things for your current product, but for future products as well. Well, and Nick, you know, I, um, I love the line you said where um, what I now do, should I commit fraud, it harms my friends. Because that's actually like a very eloquent way to describe one of the places insurance has gone horribly wrong yeah. uh, over the last, you know, 100 years, especially. Um, but, you know, because of the way the product works, that um, if people better understood where the money went, right, because one of the things I always hated about telling people I was an insurance professional, and I love insurance, like oddly, in an odd, odd way, um, that, you know, that nobody, you know, that's not appealing to anyone else, right? Oh, you're in insurance. Awesome for you. Let's talk about current events. Um, and I'm terrible at current events because I'm spending all my time on insurance. And so, you know, the, um, the thing that went wrong is uh, we, we, stop telling people where the money went, right? And, and for a bunch of good, re well, a bunch of reasons. You know, for, for one thing, we were doing terrible things to consumers as an industry. We have so many examples of this. Sure, yeah. For, for another thing, like if you're a mutual, which should have been the perfect insurance model, yeah. but Mutuals have this strange incentive where they can't raise money effectively. And so in the idea that originally it was supposed to be hyper efficient because there's no profit margin, it was just us pooling resources. When we flipped away from that accessible policy model and into a statutory surplus model, then if I needed more money, I, wasn't, I was gonna have a tough time getting it, which would put the community at risk. And so instead I sat on the cash. And so now you've got mutuals with hundred billion dollar balance sheets. Billion, billion dollar. Yeah, hundred billion dollar balance sheets because, and they don't give the money back, 
right? And then they start spending it because they're without governance. And so like all of these models um, could have been good, but instead like, it's actually like, reminds me of every crime drama I've ever seen, which is like, follow the money, right? And if you yeah. follow the money and, and you make it transparent to consumers and you, you actually do focus on taking the fat out of the product, you can just be good. And, and that's such a huge focus for us, but community pledge very much along yeah. those lines. So it, it's, um, it's one of the, it's one of the, um, I guess the things that really irk me when a lot of technologists have come into insurance, like, oh, we're just gonna disrupt this and revamp this whole thing. Um, almost coming in like this business was being run by idiots. When in fact, like um, these were well-suited operators. And I think Steve, like to your point, um, I think part of where we went wrong is like a, a lot of the executives, cause you know, some of these mutuals are like a hundred, 150 years old. And they get to a certain point. It's like, who's going to run this thing? And they ran it like a business, right? They, they operated it. This is what we inherited. Let's keep this thing going and let's not jeopardize things because, you know, nobody wants to get fired, right? And so they were skilled. They, they ran, insurance has not changed dramatically in a hundred years. They, they, they wrung it dry and milked it. But I always, now I kind of point to mutuals and I say, if you guys disappeared, would anyone even notice? Would anyone care? Well, Nick, two, two points on that. One is in 1960, there were over 4,000 mutual insurance companies in the US. Today, we've got about 1,000. So that's happening actively. But yeah. the other part is that, um, that in that, so I totally agree. It all becomes incremental. Right, you've been handed the reins to something that was special. You're just trying to make it a little bit better, um, but um, but that's not actually what consumers need. Right, uh, and yep. I, you know, and like the the two aspects of that is one, if a mutual were truly to innovate, which is hard because it yep. it should be innovating within the bounds of its membership. It's their money, right? And so, what will it do? Um, that's within their desire and they don't usually know they own it. And so like, there's a lot of maybe missing checks and balances there, but then on the totally flip side, you know, most of the insurance startups that I hear about are going to make insurance cheaper because they're going to be so much more efficient than the big mutual. And so I, I always like to tell people like you could pull a rate filing, my friend, and see that state farm has less than 5% general expenses and so if you could be hyper efficient, could you get that to one? That means that you made insurance less expensive by three and a half percent. Yeah. Whoop de do. Which it's is just part, not which, is, which is partially offset by their hundred billion dollar asset base. So they're getting afloat so they can actually oh. make that up in spades with their balance sheet. Totally. This this is actually a point I frequently make, Nick, which is the biggest penalty. You know, the barriers to entry in this market are quite high, yep. but once you're in, the, the big penalty you have is the cost of capital. It is your yep. greatest penalty for scale. I love that. Uh, it isn't the expense construct, right? This is all about, we are a business of moving capital and the savviest of us will be very effective on how capital is acquired and moves. Um, and that's, that's where you find the real, um, the real benefit uh, to how you build the long-term business. It's, it's yeah. in how you answer that question. Yeah. So I want to respect your time um, on this. You, you, I think this is a fantastic segue topic. You have, uh, you have a, a pretty uh, typical structure today. You see this a lot where um, you have an MGA, you have a carrier that you're underwriting for, but you now you have your own too. You have a reciprocal. Um, which uh, we won't, we don't need to necessarily get into too many details about that, but it's kind of like a mutual, slightly different organizational structure. So um, as you're describing that, I'm thinking, well, how, how are you going to, how are you going to manage that? You're looking into 2021, 2022, you're in several States right now. So how do, how does branch manage, manages its capital? How are you thinking of pulling all of that together so that you can bring this benefit to other states, but also continue to enhance the ones that you've 
Ben in and then Joe, you got to tie all of that stuff together. How are you guys processing this? Yeah, Nick, the short story on capital management rollout and uh, and the exchange, we didn't want to raise uh, regulatory capital through equity, right? It was in vogue when we started branch, but we just had a strong aversion, right? A good insurance business creates its own regulatory capital. And so in that sense, you'd sell the company for a rental fee on on money that you acquired. Um, And so with that as kind of one of our beliefs, Uh, We built a business so that 100 years from now, it can do just what you said. It can run a 102 comfortably because the float's four, and uh, and it makes for very efficient premiums for our customers. Um, But, you know, from a regulatory perspective, we're running a very conservative premium to surplus for two reasons. One is our regulators need that certainty, and two things can go bad with a balance sheet and you only should ever get one shot at that because uh, there's responsible and irresponsible and you're playing with people's real lives. Uh, And so we built the exchange structure, which is pretty esoteric, but it's become much more common lately uh, where the capital intensity and the risk really lies in our, in our member owned company. It also allows us to dividend excess premiums very efficiently, right? Our desire is not to, uh, to juice margin if we overshoot. It's to be excellent underwriters. And the other answer to the regulatory question is we underwrite with excellence. When, when our statutory numbers come out and, and you can look at us and our front uh, results, you know, we'll have run our target from the first year in market because we constrained for excellent underwriting with the best available science and we're differentiating on how we use a tech superpower uh, and new distribution models for the benefit of our customers in fulfilling our mission. And so that gives the regulators tremendous confidence that they wouldn't or shouldn't have had with other startups that might enter the market at a 150 to 200, right? Loss ratio. Yeah. And so all that's baked into your question. I'll, I'll uh, leave it to Joe to tie it all together. <laughs> oh, no, take us home. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think that um, I don't find the, with the tech philosophy that we have, right, which is that what we want to build is interfaces for our customers and for our agents and for our internal staff, and that we want to go find and how to buy everything else that is undifferentiated heavy lifting that is, you know, similar enough to what other people in other industries even will do, or insurance specific services like Clarion Door. And so I, I think that all of the hard tech work is actually done in that systems architecture and research and deep understanding of what's out there. Um, you know, it should be a job for someone in an organization to just know what managed services are out there that can do things for you. How do they differ? How can we use them? Um, I'm, I'm always astounded when I talk to large organizations that have built things and I say, well, why didn't you use this? Why don't you just buy this thing for a thousand dollars a month instead of spending what must be, you know, $200,000 of developer time in eight months to build it. And they'll say, oh, well, it doesn't do X. I was like, no, it actually does and has for years. Oh, I didn't realize that. I mean, like, this is the actual problem, I think, in most software development organizations is people aren't saying this is undifferentiated. This is differentiated. Uh, and so that's what we do. Yeah. Um, both of your answers just remind me of like a conversation I had, you know, I, I don't want to pass judgment on what's right and what's, what's wrong. It's really just a question of what you're trying to accomplish. Right. And I think, I think there's, there's a something to be said for getting market share and moving quickly and a broker who was evaluating um, us was, that's not my personal philosophy on that. To me, I wanted to create something of enduring value so it's like, and the only way I can do that for sure is I have to make sure my capacity partners make money. That's the only way I know for sure. And so I would rather move slowly and make sure that they're profitable than move too quickly and build up a powder keg. Um, but the flip side is that um, some astute people can get market share and they can cross their fingers and try to grow faster than that. Either way, right? But Um, there's an element here where it becomes obvious with what you guys are trying to do. It's like, if 
if your mission is the customer in the way that you're talking about backing each other's, you know, having each other's back. I, there's a saying, one of your marketing sayings, there's some copy in there. It says, um, correct me if I'm wrong, like um, covering your back so we can keep covering your back or something like that, which was that, that, that's back to kind of the old mutual philosophy as you, as you both have eloquently stated. And in order to do that, you have to endure right? Because the hurricane might take five years. So you, you have to like last to that hurricane. And so there's, a, there's an element of this particular model that I highly respect because it's, um, it's thoughtful in that way. It's like, we're looking out, our, we obsess over our customers so much so that we, we would be willing to sacrifice market share in order to make sure that they're protected and the people we're partnering with are protected. And I think there's something to be said for that. So I'm going to end it there and just um, salute this. You know, when I when um, I talk about the insure techs that have come in in this particular space, there is you know lemonade and hippo, and I think they each bring something to the table. I always throw branch in to that conversation because I say they're the only ones that are doing this bundling thing. I don't think a lot of people in the investment world give it as much credit as they need to, because I don't, I don't think they understand the nuance of it, but I salute you. You're it's a blue ocean strategy that is, is right there in your face and everyone's ignoring it. Well, Nick, I'll say, um, I think the investors like many of the startups just didn't know. Um, but I think they're catching on quickly. And one other point that you made, if you go back and look at every brand you know today in our space, they all grew to their size at a positive underwriting profit yep. because differentiation, right? The, the problem to solve for isn't just spend as much money as possible. It is to constrain for finding our product market fit is value differentiated enough to our customers that will grow rapidly while we do it, as you said, yep. the right way. And that's, that's so the hard thing to do. you have to have done. Yeah. Agreed. And, and, and the thing is, we, we're, I mean, we could talk for like another hour, but the differentiation piece of it is something I hammer home all the time because how, unless you have a billion dollar budget for advertising, how do you get in front of someone and make them interested in what you have if it's just like everybody else's? Now, uh, I think Lemonade has done a marvelous job of being able to do that. I think Hippo has done a marvelous job of being able to do that. And you have a different strategy and differentiation has to play a role for, for anyone that's listening to this, like that's stuck in the, you know, a, a mutual business model or a farm bureau business model. It, that's the one, th that's the, like almost the first thing I always say is how are you differentiated? If you disappeared, would anyone care it's the first thing you have to tackle and the bundling aspect along with all of these other pieces, just you're sort of a, a ratcheting up that differentiation. Yeah, Nick, and I, I know we're uh, getting ready to close, but <clears throat> we didn't actually punchline it. The, the differentiation of instantly providing prices by itself is really unique and will make for a really important change in the marketplace you know, the only ability to bundle in a, in a GEICO-like or progressive direct-like expense structure, that's also very different. We built the first online umbrella policy the U.S. ever seen. That's very different because our bundling market needs it. But if, if you put these things together and said, how will branch make insurance significantly less expensive? What we do with that superpower is we use it to bring insurance to moments of relevance mm -hmm. where insurance becomes a future infrastructure invisible to people you bought a house or you're buying a house that's when you should think about your insurance you shouldn't have to leave that transaction and then go find someone who's been advertising to you with your own money respectively yeah. and then choose from someone applying your own effort to do it and so you've probably seen some of the recent press from us um, these moments where insurance is the thing that uh, causes friction in another workflow creates opportunity only if you have a frictionless insurance acquisition to change the capital structure of the insurance product for a new efficiency. 
And that's, you know, we are differentiated in so many ways, but that's what will change the market to very fundamentally over time because of a capability that is built for endurance. Um, but all this had to come together. We had to own the full stack. We had to innovate on the product itself. We had to have a frictionless purchase to do a thing that a lot of people know is coming, but only branch can really bring it around. It's a fantastic way to end. I feel like I'm talking to the Buffett and Munger of, uh, of insurance. I'll let you guys arm wrestle on who's who. Uh, I, 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 you know, I, I lean towards Munger, I just, you know, but there's, you know, Buffett might be more sexy, who knows. Um, but this, is, this was fantastic. I, I appreciate you guys coming on. I appreciate all of the insights. Um, this will, we will discuss this again. We, we barely touched half the agenda anyways. And there's issues around customer acquisition and more technical issues about how, how you're going about doing that. And also what if the big guys also try to bundle? I think you partially answered that anyways, but there's a lot more here. So Steve, Joe, I appreciate it. Thank you. Congrats to you too, Nick. Looking yeah. forward to being back on episode 100. Okay. Let's <laughs> yeah. Do that. Thanks a lot. Let's do that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot.